Good afternoon. I am Keith Tabor. I'm Professor of Science Education at the University of Cambridge in England. And I very much like Professor Sonetti for asking me to record this message for you here this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of science in the education of gifted learners. My own background is in science teaching and for a number of years I taught science, mainly chemistry and physics, in secondary schools in the Further Education College. Then I moved to Cambridge and joined the Faculty of Education and initially, for a number of years, worked primarily in initial teacher education that was preparing graduates in science subjects to become teachers in schools. My main research interests are really around the areas of learning in science, in particular in the nature of conceptual learning, conceptual development and the integration of conceptual learning. But I became involved in gifting education as I developed a concern about provision for gifted learners in state schools in England, partly related to the lack of expertise we seem to be in many schools and partly related to the nature of the English curriculum context, which I'll say a little bit about. Uh, this led to originally a seminar series and a book that came from that and then a project developing materials and uh, recently I've been writing quite a bit about gifted in science. In England, something like 93% of school age pupils attend maintained schools, that is schools that are funded by the state through people's taxes. But that does mean that something like 7% of students actually don't attend state schools and attend fee paying independent schools. Usually this is because their parents are wealthy enough to send them to such schools and presumably have some reason not to want to send them to ordinary state schools. Uh, perhaps because they see the private schools as better in some way, perhaps because they don't want their children mixing with um, the kind of children who go to state schools. Um, but also these schools normally give scholarships to some students of exceptional ability or particular skills and uh, these students are allowed to attend without paying fees and in that way the private sector to some extent creams off the uh, most able students from the state sector. So in some areas some state schools actually have a very skewed ability um, profile because some of the more able students are actually going to other schools. Despite that, the vast majority of state schools, with a few exceptions, such as um, special schools for students with special needs, and in some areas, as grammar schools that, that do actually take students on the basis of uh, academic ability, but the vast majority of state schools do take students from across the full ability range. Therefore, most of these schools will have some very exceptional students and some students uh, of a whole range of other abilities as well. Um, since the 1980s, England has had an, a national curriculum, a rather prescriptive national curriculum, that sets out what should be taught to students at different levels of the system. It's particularly prescriptive in the core areas of English, maths and science. It also leads to very high state tests, and therefore teachers, understandably, to some extent, want to teach the tests. And this necessarily limits the flexibility of teachers of most classes in responding to the needs of the particular students in their lessons when they have a, a, a set out curriculum that leads towards very important examinations. Perhaps to some extent that's why the school inspectorate has identified quite a disappointing situation in terms of the provision for gifted students in English state schools, although this actually predates the national curriculum, so there were concerns about this going back some time. And in recent years there's been policies uh, to try and overcome this problem. So there's a policy on gift, so-called gifted and talented students in England. Uh, and this requires all schools to identify their gifted and talented students and to put on some kind of provision for them. But it's a very vague kind of policy and schools are very much left to their own devices. In the English system, the notion of gifted and talented is that the gifted students are those who show above average ability, particularly high ability in academic subjects. So that would include science as well as maths, history, English, geography and so on. And talented students are those who show particular ability in areas such as um, arts, crafts, sports and so on. The um, schools are normally expected to find that uh, around about 10% of their students are gifted and talented according to these kind of criteria. It's therefore very much a kind of contextual um, decision because whatever school you're in you'll be gifted and talented if you're considered to be in the top 10 percent five to ten percent and if you're not in the top five to ten percent you won't be considered gifted and talented so it's uh, in relation to the local school context. 
In England, therefore, the word gifted is not reserved for students of exceptionally high ability in the way it sometimes is in some other contexts. The issue of whether students in science classes in English secondary schools were being sufficiently challenged was one that uh, vexed a number of science educators in England. And I had conversations with a number of colleagues, and in particular, uh, Professor John Gilbert, who then was based at Reading, and some people will know is, is um, the editor of the International Journal of Science Education, and has since been at King's College London, and Professor Mike Watts, who was then at Roehampton, but then later moved to Brunel University. Um, and together we put in for some money from the Faculty of Education at Cambridge to start a seminar series and um, were granted a small amount from the Research Development Fund and put on a, a series on meeting the needs of the most able in science. Um, this was a seminar series that was attended by some academics, um, by some research students, by some of the local teachers, by some of the trainee teachers and over a period of about three years it explored quite a number of issues and at the end of this it actually led to the development of a, an edited book that was published by um, Routledge called Science Education for Gifted Learners that is still available today and I, as far as I'm aware is one of the very few books on that particular topic. There are a number of books about giftedness but there aren't many books out there for teachers about how you deal with gifted learners in science. In fact on that um, particular topic I'm currently involved with a, a colleague Professor um, Manabu Samida in preparing a, a number of books for Routledge on science education for the gifted and STEM education for the gifted. But at the moment, those, this is one of the few books that's actually available. During the time that we were working on the seminar series, uh, the government announced a project that invited universities to be involved in on teaching about ideas and evidence. And universities working in initial teacher education were invited to submit proposals to be part of this project. Teaching about ideas and evidence was a key part of the national curriculum in science, but it was generally felt to be a part that wasn't done especially well and where teachers felt under-supported and under-informed. Cambridge is one of the universities that applied to take part and along with a number of other institutions, uh, the Institute of Education in London, King's College London and the Universities of Keele and York. We are set up a small project with our teacher training students um, to try and look at this idea of how you can best teach about ideas and evidence. Um, at Cambridge we decided to also make this a way of developing the students research skills. The project was supported by the um, educational charity Gatsby SEP and um, they produced materials in the form of a CD-ROM which was made available to schools and those materials were later made available um, via National STEM website. So we wrote up the work we did at Cambridge in the School Science Review and it was also reported as part of the seminar series. The interest of the Gatsby Charitable Foundation um, in the project which we worked on for the government led to a bid to the same foundation to support a new project um, which was done in partnership with a number of schools in Cambridge, a number of the state secondary schools, where we developed uh, an after school enrichment program for 14 to 15 year olds who were considered gifted by their schools to give them a bit more challenge, something a bit different in the evening. Um, this only ran over seven sessions, it was quite a small program, but the idea was to give them something a little bit different, to get them to meet gifted students from other schools, and to put them in a situation where they were treated as adults and the requirements on them were rather different from uh, school classrooms where we considered that perhaps they weren't being stretched enough. Uh, we thought about the kind of things we should use for that, 
and obviously it was a science project so there were science topics but in particular we looked at the nature of science because we thought that was particularly challenging for gifted students. We also fed in material about um, metacognition and for most of the activities required students to work in groups including groups across schools so normally there was a group of four students um, who didn't really know each other because they were from at least two different schools. Part of the logic behind the ASCEND project relates to the notion of what we might call critical mass. One issue for gifted learners is by definition they are atypical of most students. They're students who are achieving at a level higher than expected for a typical student of their grade. Therefore, most of the time, gifted learners in, in mixed schools, in comprehensive schools, do not have that many peers who are like-minded, who are thinking at similar levels to themselves. And it's considered as although I think it's very good for gifted learners to mix with all students, they should spend at least some of their time working with other gifted learners who can challenge each other and act as models for each other. So if you can improve the critical mass, then that's better for the students. The other issue, of course, is an issue of resources, because although schools have been required in England to look after the needs of their gifted students, they weren't given any particular resources to do that. And if your gifted students are a small proportion of the total, then you can't put particular resource to that. You can only give them a small share of the generally available resource. However, if you get schools to work together, then several schools can pool resources and pool their gifted students and provide some kind of provision that way. So part of the logic in Ascend was working with a small group of schools that actually as a group, we could develop a program that they may take up together. Unfortunately, that didn't happen mainly for political reasons in the English system, that at the time we started Ascend, schools were actually being encouraged by the government to work together, but that didn't last very long. And the general atmosphere was that schools were basically competing for students. So asking them to work together too much was never going to be very um, viable in that kind of environment. Although it was very disappointing that the schools weren't able to work together and continue to use the programme that had been developed, the materials were still used on a similar basis within the initial teacher education programme. So we had a gifted science day on a number of years, a challenging science day, when gifted students from local schools came in, worked with the trainee teachers and used some of the materials from the actual project. The materials were published by SEP in a book with a CD inside. Um, which although had a limited prompt print run and isn't available as a published book very easily today, is still available from download from the National STEM Centre. So all those materials are available and there have been some papers written about them in various teacher journals so that hopefully they are still being used out there in schools, even if not quite in the type of arrangement of schools working together that was originally intended. So as been explained, the involvement in gifted education work really came from a concern within the science curriculum itself, a concern that the science curriculum in England wasn't sufficiently challenging for students, at least the way it was enacted in schools. However, this leads to thinking about the role of science within the curriculum for those students and indeed all students, and what the purpose of schooling is. Because if ever we're thinking about why we should teach some particular thing, we should always go back to our ideas about why we have schools and why we have education in the first place. So if you think about the question of why we teach subjects in the curriculum, why we teach science, or for that matter any other subject, we might suggest there are a number of potential rationales. One of these is an economic rationale. Um, society needs workers. Society needs people to take up roles to keep the economy going. We need people who can produce things. We need people who can design things. So we need scientists. We need engineers. We need medical personnel and so forth. These people all need a scientific training. So part of the purpose of a science curriculum is to prepare people to enter into roles in society that will actually require them to have some scientific knowledge. Another possible rationale is a cultural rationale. 
what we might think of as a kind of liberal rationale that um, part of the purpose of education is to induct young people into the culture and the culture has various aspects so dance is an aspect of culture and music is an aspect of culture literature and so forth in the same way science and technology are aspects of culture so any adequate education is going to actually involve giving students a, a taste and a feel for different areas of culture including science so science education should give students a taste of what science is a third rationale is what we might call a civil or civic rationale which is the idea that for people to take their place in a, a democratic society then they're going to need a certain set of knowledge a certain set of skills so for example people will leave school and go out and they will live and act in the environment and the environment needs to be looked after and to understand that you need a certain level of scientific knowledge people will be voters voting in the elections and scientific issues will arise such as is it a good idea to build nuclear power stations and again some pe people need some level of scientific knowledge and understanding to be able to deal with that people may wish to join certain um, interest groups or certain pressure groups related to issues to do with science and technology people have to make decisions in their personal lives about waste for instance how much effort they're going to put into recycling are they going to buy products that claim to have special properties uh, I remember something being advertised on television having a magic molecule. Um, people need a certain knowledge of science to understand these things and make these decisions. They will face medical decisions in their lives. They will be uh, offered treatment for themselves or their family. That treatment will have possible benefits and possible risks. They will need to be able to think about these things and, and make decisions based on a certain rationale. So for all these reasons, people need science education. But there's also another aspect which you might call a developmental rationale that part of the purpose of going to school is to develop to our full potential. That's intellectual development as well as aesthetic development and moral development and so forth. And so science education potentially has a role to play in all of these things. And I would suggest in particular science has traditionally been associated with a certain type of thinking skills, logical, rational thinking. And certainly in that regard, science can play a role, although so can mathematics and certain other areas. However, science also develops other thinking skills, such as creative thinking skills, something we don't always think about in terms of science. But nonetheless, the developmental rationale, I think, is a very important one, because unless we're developing people in schools, we're not really educating them in a very meaningful way. This leads to a consideration of what kind of learning opportunities are genuinely educative. And I would suggest we need to consider here the characteristics of a particular learner and how that's matched to A, the challenge we're making of them, and B, the level of support that's available. So Vygotsky suggested that students learn and make development when they're in their zone of proximal development, their zone of next development. So simply giving students exercises that they can easily complete may give them good practice, it may make them less error prone, but it's not really developing them very much. On the other hand, giving students challenges that are beyond what they can currently achieve is clearly not going to be a very strong way of helping them to develop and is a very strong way of helping them get very frustrated and turned off from school. So what we need to do is to give students sufficient challenge such that they have the potential to develop but at the same time give them the right level of support so they can succeed in those challenges. Now in any particular classroom, students are going to be at different levels of existing ability, different levels of existing knowledge, different levels of existing skill, different levels of existing motivation. Therefore, what counts as a major challenge to one student needn't necessarily to another. But one way or another, we have to make sure that the gifted students are sufficiently challenged whilst being given the support they need to actually make that progress. So as a science educator, I'm particularly interested in how science might be a suitable context for students' development and therefore a suitable context for challenging the most able students in particular. 
there's already some evidence that this is indeed quite possible. Um, the CASE project, the very famous project that was based at King's College London, um, directed by Philip Adey and Michael Shea, which worked over a number of years and produced materials for students lower secondary level, so 11, 12, 13 year olds, um, and basically gave them science-based projects, science-based problems to look at that were particularly structured so as to help them develop towards what Piaget called formal operations. And formal operations is of course very necessary in science and in many other areas of life because it enables us to actually think in abstract ways using um, symbols as themselves the kind of the subject of further operations. So all kinds of complex intellectual abstract thought depend upon this. In Piaget's own model formal operations were seen as the fourth and final level but there are many people who've argued actually formal operations doesn't represent the pinnacle of human thought. So this then leads to a question of uh, whether science can provide a suitable context for developing thought beyond the Piagetian model. Uh, the case research itself reported some quite positive and promising findings. The suggestion was that uh, in schools where students followed the case materials, the cognitive acceleration through science education materials in their lower school, then a number of years later, something like four, four years later, they found that uh, on average students tended to perform better in the science end of school exams than other students, but also better in English and maths as well, suggesting that the skills developed through this particular project weren't limited to science itself and actually were developing general intellectual thinking skills. Now there are a number of areas of science curriculum, or at least of, of work that could be part of the science curriculum, should be part of the science curriculum, which might be considered to be particularly strong candidates for activities that can help students develop what might be called post-formal thinking. One of these areas relates to the nature of science, to the philosophy of science if you like, to the idea of where scientific knowledge comes from and what its status is and why particular scientific ideas have faded away and others have come and taken their place and so on. Another issue is socio-scientific issues, uh, issues where the scientific knowledge is important but you can't make decisions based on the scientific knowledge alone. So for example if a government is deciding whether to build more nuclear power stations then that decision is only going to be a, a sound decision if it's based on strong scientific knowledge. But you can't make that decision based only on scientific knowledge because there are other considerations that have to be taken into account. If you like, value judgments have to be brought in as well as hard science. And these are areas that students tend to find very challenging and therefore these are areas that potentially can be very good um, contexts for actually challenging gifted students and helping them to develop their thinking well beyond just formal operations. And in fact these are the kinds of areas that are included in the Ascend project. So there are activities there on looking at aspects of the nature of science, the philosophy of science, the use of models in science, the nature of the scientific law and so forth, and even an activity there which was looking at um, a social issue related to scientific knowledge. So science education may have a strong role to play in helping young people move beyond relativism. There's a good deal of research that shows that when children are very young, they think knowledge is very straightforward, that things are either true or not true, and there's no in-betweens. Of course, as they go through education, as they get older and mature, they come across lots of situations where it isn't simply a matter of something being true or not true. They start to reach a situation where different people have different opinions and each opinion seems reasonable. And there's a tendency to children to move away from truth as being absolute and given and starting to think that truth is really just relativist and that if people can have different views and all those views seem reasonable then it's really just a matter of personal choice and there's no strong basis for favouring one view over another. Now intellectual and moral development requires students to move beyond that to develop a personal system of values and to build up a system of personal understanding 
where they do take positions on things and those positions are principled even if they have to accept that they can't be absolutely ground positions that other people might reasonably take different positions from themselves and it doesn't mean that one person's right and one person's wrong but it doesn't simply mean people have a, a point of view based purely on some kind of um, momentary choice or or purely a matter of taste it can go much beyond that that's actually very difficult for people to develop and uh, there's um, research from the United States, for instance, that was done with elite gifted undergraduates that suggested that even during an undergraduate degree, students are struggling with this process. Science here can be particularly useful due to the complexity of science and the complexity of how we come to knowledge. One of the real problems of teaching the nature of science to young people is the nature of scientific knowledge, because scientific knowledge is technically always provisional. Any scientific finding is always potentially open to being revisited in the light of new evidence or a new perspective, a new way of looking at things. Now, of course, there are lots of things that science suggests are virtually um, definitive, virtually absolute. There are things that we think it's extremely unlikely science would change its mind about. But then there have been things in the past that seem pretty definitive, like uh, Newton's notion of space and time, for instance which then proved to be not the most useful way of thinking about things. So teaching children that scientific knowledge is reliable, it is robust, it is a good basis for making decisions, but it's never absolute, it's never definitive, it's never final, is very difficult and requires students to understand actually just because a scientist says something, that doesn't mean it's sound scientific knowledge. And if two scientists disagree over something, that doesn't mean that science isn't able to come to sound knowledge, but that even the most robust scientific knowledge should never be seen as being absolute and definitive. Now teaching that is a real challenge and that particular set of ideas, that particular principle, is certainly in a very useful context for helping students develop their thinking. And because we can do it in science, we can do it in a situation which is away from their emotionally charged personal views about, about more um, socially relevant issues. Although of course science also offers us socio-cultural issues where the science is only one part of the story and that probably offers an even greater challenge to most students. I referred earlier to the association between science and logical thinking, science and rationality, and that's very important. Science requires logic, it requires rational thinking, it requires careful examination of facts and evidence and looking at consequences. It requires people to think about hypotheses, what will happen in certain situations, what certain evidence might mean. All of this is very important. Science education is in part, therefore, an education in logical thinking, an education in being rational, an education in looking at the evidence and evaluating it, in looking carefully at what the consequences of certain things are, of what's ruled in and ruled out by certain possibilities, what alternatives might be admissible in certain situations. It's also a training in developing arguments, in actually making a case for something based on evidence and providing warrants and grounds. All of that's very important. However, what can easily be lost in school science if it becomes down to learning lots of facts, learning lots of principles, learning lots of ideas to be, to be used in exercises and applied, is that science is intrinsically a very creative process. Top scientists are very creative people and gifted students who are creative shouldn't be put off science by thinking it's logical and, and, and fact-based because it's not just that, it is actually something that requires them to be very creative and provides, provides scope for creativity for professional scientists. It does worry me though that in countries like England the curriculum doesn't really emphasise this very much at all. Um, the famous historian of science, uh, Thomas Kuhn, talks a lot about scientists working within paradigms which were quite restrictive and in effect using convergent thought. But he also pointed out that science always has a divergent stage. So science always relies on people creating ideas, new ideas, new ways of thinking before they can be tested. And it's very important that science education reflects that. And that therefore we think about science not only as a means of developing logical thinking, but actually as a very important tool to provide students with opportunities to be creative, because that's a large part of what science is about.
Our starting point then was a concern, a concern that in many English secondary schools, a lot of the most gifted students weren't really being challenged and therefore weren't really being engaged with science. Yet, as we've explained today, there are actually important ways in which science can make a major contribution to the curriculum by helping develop students' thinking in ways that are important for all learners. Perhaps we don't do enough of this kind of science teaching because it is so challenging and that many students will require a lot of support. But that's not really a good enough reason because this is the kind of science education that actually will benefit all learners and will help us develop students who are going to make a great contribution to the world in the future. Therefore we have to provide the right level of support as well as the right level of challenge. I hope you found this talk interesting and I'd like to thank the organisers again for inviting me to present to you and uh, I hope this has stimulated some thinking and will link with your own work. Thank you very much.